everyone. Welcome to the U.S. Heartland China Association's The Way Forward webinar series. I'm Min Fan, Executive Director of the U.S. Heartland China Association. Our topic today is Current Challenges to U.S.-China Educational Collaborations. This topic is near and dear to me since I'm very much a product of both educational systems. I had studied at the university um, in Beijing and then finished my graduate study at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So I look forward to learning the perspectives and insights from our panelists, along with the 400 plus participants we have today. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor and China US Exchange Foundation and the many partners that made this event possible. Um, for our participants today, remember that you can submit questions at any time through the Q&A option. We did receive a lot of questions submitted already and our panelists will address them through their remarks. There will be a very brief survey at the end and we appreciate your feedback. With that, let me turn over to our chairman, Bob Holden, for opening remarks. Governor Holden. Thank you, Min Fan, and I'm delighted with the, the great audience today. And thank you, Blaine Burnell, for your leadership as chairman of uh, this education effort. Education is an equalizer in our culture. I started out in a one-room schoolhouse. There was only three in my first grade class, and I graduated from high school with 25 and then went on to college and met a professor there that taught international relations. And our, our second son is named after that professor. That's how important and personal education is to me. Our Heartland region has much to offer in educational services. 94 of the best higher educational institutions in the country are located in our 20 state region. Every one of the 20 states have at least one major university with academic credentials. In addition, five of the 15 top universities in the country for Chinese American students going to school here come from our heartland region. So we have much to offer and much to tell. And our job is to do a better job of promoting who we are, what we are, and what we want to do because we need to make sure that we are offering the educational opportunity that all the people in our region, all of our students have. So again, let me say thank you to Blaine for his leadership on all of this. And Blaine, I'm looking forward to listening to the discussion too. Good luck. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Holden. As, um, as Governor Holden said, um, the U.S. and China have both benefited greatly over the last 30, 40 years from these educational collaborations. And today we're going to focus on the specific challenges now posed for U.S.-China educational collaboration. And to the extent possible, in a time of such uncertainty, how we can sustain and develop these relationships in the future. And we're very fortunate to have with us uh, a very distinguished panel, and I want to thank them all in advance for, uh, for this um, uh, commitment that they have made. Um, they are Dr. Andrew Martin, who is Chancellor and Professor of Law and Political Science at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Zhou is joining the panel from Beijing. He earned his PhD in government from Cornell University and is former Dean of the School of International Studies at Peking University and Director of the Institute of Global Cooperation and Understanding. Philip Albach is Research Professor, Founding Director of the Center for International Education at Boston College and author of books and essays on international education. David Chung is Professor Emeritus and former Chancellor for Global Programs at the Tandon School of Engineering at New York University and former Chancellor for Global Programs. Michael Brzezinski has studied, lived, and worked in China and is now Dean of International Programs at Purdue University. Liu Yawei came to study from China to the United States and is now Director of the China Research Center at the Carter Center in Atlanta and adjunct professor of political science at Emory University. 
thank you all again for being uh, here. I look forward uh, to your remarks and, uh, and also to questions from the other participants. Um, Dr. Martin, would you please uh, start us off and set the stage for this conversation, um, especially from the perspective of a university leader? Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and greetings uh, from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you and for convening this panel. I am really honored to be here. Uh, at Washington University, we are proud to partner with a number of Chinese higher education institutions as we work to advance our tripartite mission of education, research, and patient care. Um, in fact, over the course of the past several months, I have been extremely grateful for the partnerships we have in place in China as we've expressed solidarity with one another and renewed our commitment to collaboration in order to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 with the eventual shared goal to eradicate this terrible disease. The letters of solidarity exchanged by our partners have reminded me exactly why our partnerships should not only persist, but strengthen in the coming months and years. This is also why I've been so disheartened by the actions that aim to subvert the collaborative spirit we have worked so hard to build. As we have said in a recent university statement in response to actions of the administration in Washington, I quote, we urge our leaders to further consider the extraordinary value our international scholars bring to advancing our national interests through their important contributions at our colleges and universities and to allow them continued participation in our educational institutions. To that end, here at Washington University, we believe that collaboration between the United States and China with regard to higher education is a win-win. Let me discuss this through the lens of education, research, and international relations. Simply put, educational partnerships create opportunities for Chinese students, opportunities for students in the United States, um, as well as uh, to have programs uh, resident in China. One example that we are very proud of is our joint executive MBA program with Fudan University. Students who go through that program have become leaders of businesses in China. Students become alumni of both WashU and Fudan University, which confers benefits for both institutions. In addition, the, um, the alumni then help to foster further collaboration between the universities, as well as between businesses located here in the United States and in China. Ultimately, it's the personal relationships and personal affinity which can help to cut through problems that arise in collaboration. In addition, at WashU, we have a unique program that is designed to recruit and train PhD students academically and to be leaders called the McDonnell International Scholars Program. It financially supports, supports students with tuition and stipend. In addition to re receiving training in their academic program, students receive leadership training and receive a global perspective getting to know students from around the globe. Equally important is cross-national research collaboration. To collaborate on research programs which solve important problems that cut across borders and which each party has something unique to offer. For example, work on climate change is one such area. It is important that these collaborations are done in a mutually beneficial fashion, protecting intellectual property rights of the inventors and making sure that paths to commercialization remain open. Much facilitation is done at the faculty level colleagues seeking out those with whom they have mutual interests. In addition, facilitation can happen institutionally. This is the model we have used at Washington University through our McDonald International Scholars Academy, um, as well as with a set of strategic relations with universities across the globe, including many in China. A final lens is through international relations in the global political economy. Simply put, higher education can be the glue to bring countries together today. We have seen this at Washington University. All that being said, there are still a number of concerns we need to weigh through. First, of course, is the avail availability of others to get visas to study in the United States. Washington University and the leading research universities um, strongly oppose uh, the visa restrictions that came out uh, yesterday afternoon from, uh, from the administration. Thankfully, that action did not change OPT, uh, which provides opportunities for students studying here on a student visa to stay and work in the United States. Uh, Washington University is strongly supportive um, of the continuation uh, or the extension of the OPT program. Finally, I'm concerned about our ability to travel, uh, to study and to do research in China. Of course, the pandemic um, has affected travel uh, quite significantly and it will be interesting to see what the world looks like um, on the other side of the pandemic. Despite these concerns, I 
remain hopeful that our collaboration and our exchange of ideas and scholarship will continue. As higher education institutions, this is an opportunity for us to be a model to the world for positive partnership and the mutual gains that can come from international camaraderie. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Martin. Um, Phil Albach has been writing about international education for some time, and especially over the last um, year or two, about the challenges concerning U.S.-China collaboration and the role of China in international education. And um, would you give us a, a broad overview of the challenges that are currently we now face with all of these headwinds, health-wise and otherwise, uh, that we're, we're facing, uh, Phil, so we can kind of get a broader context for the rest of the conversation? Sure. Uh, and some of these issues have been mentioned already by Chancellor Martin. Um, but uh, I'm going to focus um, on the, the, the downside, because in my view, uh, the relationship between uh, the United States and China at the moment and the broader uh, uh, issues relating to uh, international exchange uh, and other, uh, um, uh, other related uh, questions are largely negative uh, at the moment. Of course, the American academic community is unanimously in favor of mutual understanding of, uh, of uh, uh, robust internationalization programs for many different reasons uh, and so on. Unfortunately, the academic community in America at the moment has relatively little influence uh, on the, uh, the uh, uh, regime in, uh, in, in Washington. So let me mention just a few uh, elements which I think are of central importance for understanding uh, how the relations uh, between the United States and China and, how, and what this means for individuals, for students and their families who may be considering uh, consider studying here, or for that matter, for American and Chinese universities who are uh, considering and, and wanting to strengthen their own uh, relations. Uh, the underlying issue, of course, and Chancellor Martin has uh, politely uh, alluded to this, uh, is the Trump administration at the moment. And, you know, uh, almost everything, in fact, I would say everything uh, that has emanated from Washington in the last couple of years has been deeply problematical uh, for U.S.-China relations uh, uh, in, uh, broadly and for the, uh, the, the, the work of educational institutions uh, in, uh, in particular. Uh, Chancellor Martin mentioned uh, OPT, Optional Practical Training, which is an important issue in the thinking of many international students who, who are considering coming to the United States or who are in the United States now. Uh, and although it has not yet been canceled, uh, most people think it probably will be uh, in the coming period. We don't know. And in fact, uh, not knowing is one of the central issues facing all of us in the academic community. And again, for students and their families uh, overseas and in the US, uh, because uh, policies uh, change um, on an almost daily basis and it's unclear what's going on. So this lack of, uh, of uh, this lack of certainty is certainly a key issue. Um, it's not uh, uh, clear what the uh, particular um, relations uh, between the, the uh, U.S. and China will be uh, relating to what kind of uh, research can be done. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, there have been already some restrictions in the last uh, uh, um, short period of time, which have been again opposed uh, ineffectively uh, by the academic uh, community um, concerning uh, what kind of research and the relationships between U.S. universities and Chinese universities that, quote, may have military ties, unquote, uh, in, uh, in, in, in China. Uh, there is a general feeling in the uh, that, that uh, among uh, families and their, uh, students and their families that uh, the United States may not be a safe country uh, at the moment. And I think those feelings, particularly relating to COVID, uh, are largely uh, justified. Um, that is, some parts of the country, and including a number of uh, uh, heartland states, 
I won't mention names here, have been less rigorous uh, in their dealings with the COVID environment. And not surprisingly, uh, many people are concerned about the safety, uh, uh, their, their safety uh, in the US in general and in some of the states that have been less rigorous uh, in, uh, uh, in particular. There is the issue of uh, intellectual property, which um, is a real issue. Uh, you know, there are questions there which, are, which need to be answered. Uh, and uh, uh, act, uh, activities by Chinese scholars and Chinese institutions uh, in the US, which are troubling uh, and not just uh, propaganda, they're real. Um, uh, so those are some of the, I think, problematical areas. Uh, on the positive side, uh, American, uh, many American universities still have a very good reputation in China and particularly the, uh, and Chancellor, uh, several of the speakers have mentioned this already, uh, the um, land grant research universities in the heartland states are widely known in China and elsewhere around the world, have a very high reputation and have a long tradition of uh, exchange and uh, uh, educating students from many different uh, countries, sorry. Um, so I think um, those are some of the, 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 the key issues which we need to uh, worry about. Um, the numbers of Chinese students uh, coming to the U.S. had begun to level off and even decline a little prior to COVID and prior to the Trump administration. So these are sort of broader issues. And I think the, the boom uh, for Chinese enrollment in the United States uh, is finished, but the numbers will still be robust and everything that we can do on both sides uh, to make it possible uh, for students from all over the world, but particularly from China, uh, uh, to uh, encourage them to study in the U.S. are positive. So thanks very much. Thank you, um, Bill. Um, uh, proceeding to try to get even further into some of the details, um, Mike Brzezinski has been um, at um, one of the major heartland research universities for some years and has had dealings over many years with Chinese students coming to study in the United States and also with the impact on advanced research programs of a lot of these these recent uh, actions. And um, so, Mike, could you give us uh, a little rundown on, on some of these details following on what Phil said? Sure, and thank you, Blaine. Um, I'll first talk a little bit about an historical perspective and then get into some of those details. Um, most of us know, I think, that a pivotal moment occurred in 1978 when normalization between the US and China was underway. Uh, there's an interesting story that uh, the science advisor to Jimmy Carter, our president at that time, called him in the middle of the night, uh, that December of that year. He was in negotiations with Deng Xiaoping. He wanted to know at that moment if China could send 5,000 students to the US. And I think all of us know Carter's response was, tell him to send 100,000. Uh, here we are some 40 plus years later with over nearly 400,000 students from China studying in the US. Um, and furthermore, we've had thousands of U.S. students studying in the PRC, certainly not to the same extent, but a very significant number. Likewise, large numbers of Chinese scientists have advanced, enhanced their knowledge and research skills through time spent at many of our universities. And many, many Chinese graduates now are working in all, working and living, they live in the U.S. and they're working in all of our major companies and universities. These kinds of outcomes were unimaginable 50 years ago. No one would have thought this. National governmental policies have always influenced how and when educational exchange and the flow of talent across national borders occur. Governments often view student and scholar mobility as a means to not only understand the other better, but also a way to influence the other, a form of soft power. Now, the U.S. government certainly has viewed the Sino-U.S. relationship this way. 
Engagement's been the means that the U.S. government has used to relate to the PRC um, for more than 40 years. We've seen it in the areas of education, business, politics, all walks of life. China's opening to the world has led to tremendous economic and educational changes within its borders. But I believe that many U.S. government leaders would argue that there has not been, in their mind, a significant change in the political arena and there has been insufficient changes in the business and trade areas. And some would even argue that we have been taken advantage of in the latter two areas. Administrators and faculty within U.S. higher ed have often been apolitical, enjoying the benefits of the flow of talent to and from China. But these are two very different lenses. But as I've stated, it's national policies at the government level that determines the course of international exchange, the flow of talent across national borders, not so much higher education. And I believe it's the, the US government's perceived um, view that there's been insufficient change of the political and business areas that has led us to a new approach to engaging China. It really seems to me to be a paradigmatic shift from engagement to one more of containment. Um, Phil's alluded to this already, but our, our federal government has shifted from the principles of engagement for the last 40 years to principles now that seem to want to contain, restrict, control, and confront. So this is kind of a very brief overview of think where we've come in the last 40 years. And I would like to just talk a bit about um, what does it all mean for higher ed? When you add COVID-19 into the um, picture, I think we have a very unfortunate, perfect bad storm that's leading to some of the following issues. And I'll just make some of these predictions that I believe are, are, are coming to pass here. There has been, and I think there's gonna be a, a continued general decline of interest by Chinese student population to pursue a US education at all levels, undergraduate, masters, and PhD. With some of the restrictions that are happening now, as uh, Phil mentioned, I'm sure we'll get into it more later, Canada, Australia, and the UK will continue to look much more appealing with more easily accessible post-graduation employment opportunities. A decline in the number of PRC students in the US will, who have been overly dependent upon PRC student enrollment. The universities who have been in that situation, particularly at the undergraduate level, will face significant budgetary challenges as early as this fall. Fewer Chinese students having access to the US job market after graduating from our universities and colleges. There will be fewer Chinese researchers, I think, unfortunately, visiting our U.S. campuses, especially in the high-tech, robotic, artificial intelligence, and telecommunication areas. There is and will continue to be an increase in restrictions on the hiring of foreign nationals. Um, just yesterday, a presidential executive order was signed suspending, most notably, H-1B, H-4, L-1, and certain J-1 visa issuances for not only Chinese nationals, but all foreign nationals. The coveted OT, OPT employment benefit that attracts foreign nationals to our country will continue to be under attack, leading to a decrease in the amount of time an F1 student may engage in post-graduation employment. But I think there will be an increase in the growth of PRC and US student learning via virtual education, virtual exchange. And because of all of this, I think there'll be a decline in the number of American students who can study in China, not only due to COVID-19, but due to the fact that exchanges would be out of balance if we're not receiving Chinese students and the US students just can't go that way. I think Confucius Institutes will continue to decline in number, especially those that have a PRC visiting scholar in any type of stateside leadership role. And last, I'd like to just make a few comments about this fall semester. With the US visa offices at our embassies and consulates throughout China still closed, it's becoming more and more likely that there will be no new Chinese students coming from China to enroll in our universities and colleges this August or September. A ban on travel from China to the US for non-US citizens, permanent residents, and family members of US citizens is still in effect. Many institutions, and Purdue is one of them, are counting on admitted PRC students to enroll online this fall with the hope that such students will be able to get here to attend in person during the spring 2021 semester. But January travel can only occur if these offices open and if the U.S. travel ban on PRC citizens is lifted. For few Chinese nationals can travel to another country, self-quarantine there for 14 days, and then try to travel to the U.S. So I'll stop here with my general comments, and I think we'll be able to dive deeper into various areas during our Q&A and panelist discussion time. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mike. It's always a...
important for me to see that uh, Purdue has survived the five years I spent there as a junior faculty member. And uh, so <laughs> congratulations uh, on that. Um, I think to just uh, interject, I think most people don't understand the degree to which um, a lot of the intellectual vigor of a number of our science and engineering programs over many years have been actually uh, provided um, by a lot of Chinese students and other international students. Um, and these, because these programs simply don't have adequate US student um, enrollment. Uh, but in any case, uh, these patterns are always shifting and will shift uh, in the future. Um, I want to turn to Yahweh because the, the um, President Carter has always come up and he is now working in the Carter Center in charge of their research, uh, Chinese research uh, operation. Um, so he is a living, breathing product of this relationship um, and is particularly indebted to, uh, to President Carter. Yahweh, you want to? Weigh in on this from your perspective. Thank you, uh, Blaine, for your introduction. Uh, I think Mike has, uh, to a certain extent, uh, stolen my thunder. But in my allocated uh, five-minute time slot, I want to first go personal, uh, and then uh, national, and then come down to institutional issue. Now, in terms of my personal experience, uh, like uh, what Min said early on, that uh, I'm a product uh, like uh, Professor Jia Qingguo, the difference is, you know, he returned. Uh, so we're product of U.S.-China Educational Exchange. And we all, particularly me, I face uh, three uh, decision phases. The first one is to apply or not to apply. Uh, for details, uh, please see the article uh, that um, uh, U.S. Heartland China Association just uh, circulated in the newsletter. So I decided to apply. The second issue is to stay or not to stay. And then I made the decision to stay. And the third issue is to be or not to be. Uh, that is, you know, do I stay uh, PRC national or do I uh, agree to be naturalized as an American citizen? And I also made the, that decision. Uh, given what uh, all the others have uh, talked about, uh, it looks like people like me were now getting back to another decision cycle, that is to return or not to return. Even though we are already American citizens, many of us, uh, we feel that uh, the prospect of, of us leaving here freely, uh, free of heckling and harassment may be over and we should be prepared uh, for that. So that's my uh, personal experience. Now on the national uh, level, I want to focus on two issues. Number one is what do we know? And number two is what do we not know? In terms of what we know, I think the Chinese started uh, sending students uh, to America. This is very Chinese. That is the government uh, will send students to America. The first group is actually from the Qing dynasty almost 150 years ago uh, in 1872. You know, of that group, uh, Zhang Tianyu uh, became uh, very instrumental in the revolution of railroad transportation and Tang Shaoyi eventually became the foreign minister. And then we move rapidly to 1978, 79, Mike uh, talked about the midnight phone call, even though President Carter said, you know, sent 100,000 students to the US, uh, actually on the first year, the Chinese government only sent 52 students, again, on government uh, stipend, on government payroll. Now, 89, we had a huge explosion. Uh, so the Chinese students here uh, got to about 34,000. And then 10 years later to 45,000, and then 2009 to 127,000, until last year, uh, as both Phil and Mike uh, mentioned, uh, close to uh, 370,000. Even though, uh, in uh, terms of uh, growth rate, uh, it's the first uh, dip, uh, but in terms of absolute numbers, uh, last year is still slightly more uh, than the previous year. Th this is what we know. Now, second, what we know is uh, uh, why do American colleges and universities accept Chinese students and researchers? Uh, I think uh, both Mike, Phil, uh, and Chancellor Martin, uh, to some extent, answer this question. You know, there is the idealistic approach. You know, we're educating a new generation 
uh, of people that will not only contribute to China or to the US, but to the uh, humankind. But there is also the realistic or materialistic incentive. Uh, you know, this is where actually uh, China has the largest deficit uh, with, with the US. I, I think me on the first slide, you see how much uh, Chinese uh, students are contributing uh, to the American uh, economy. Now, the second question here is we know, probably not for sure, but I think the guess is not too much off the mark, is why do Chinese parents send their kids to the US? Does that say something uh, about uh, where the Chinese education system is going? Does that say something very positive about the American education system? And uh, you know, they are offering an opportunity for their kids to choose between two countries. Uh, even though uh, Mike uh, talked about Australia, UK, and, and other countries, uh, Chinese students' number are growing. Uh, I think US is still uh, the best uh, in terms of post-graduation opportunities. And Australia, I think, to a certain extent, is leading the charge against China. And uh, I think one of the questions uh, posed to us is about the university tracker uh, in terms of Chinese universities with ties to the military uh, that were blacklisted. Uh, recently by the US. Now the third uh, question here is why do Chinese governments still allow it to happen? I mean, isn't this a massive brain drain for China? Uh, why, why does the government still allow the Chinese students and the researchers to come over here? Do they have, is it the issue that they, they have confidence that they can always appeal to those Chinese who have decided to stay here and to ask them to be patriotic and contribute to the rights of China? Uh, or do the leaders themselves are selfish enough that you know they want their kids to have the second opportunity uh, over here? Now these are the questions that we probably have the answers, but the bigger issue is the questions that we don't have uh, the answers. Uh, for example, I think there are sporadic numbers, but there is no uh, systematic study on this, it is the total number of Chinese students and scholars who came to the US since 1979. I've seen numbers like three to four million. And the next issue is how many of them have stayed here? Uh, if they stay here, what are they doing? What kind of contribution are they making uh, to the American uh, science and technology, to the American social sciences, you know, to American financial and other uh, areas? Now, uh, does US really want to shut the door that connects the two countries really well? Uh, does US want to not be what it's best known for, that is the magnet for people who are not just hungry, who are not just starving and poor, but for others who are talented. I think even the Chinese 1000 uh, talent uh, program is an indication. It's, uh, they're losing people to the US and they want to lure them back with massive uh, financial uh, incentives for them to get back. So Americans should be proud of what it has done and should continue uh, to make decisions in a way that will, uh, you know, to quote, even though I don't like to quote uh, him, is to make America great again. You know, losing this side uh, of, of the, uh, you know, the incoming talent, uh, it's not going to make America great again. Uh, on this very issue, uh, I will ask uh, our audience and, and uh, to read a recent uh, New York Times article on AI and the Chinese researchers' contribution to it. I'm not going to go through the details, but the article's title is a US secret weapon in AI, Chinese talent. Finally, I'm gonna go institutional because a lot of the questions posed to us uh, is about Confucius Institute. I think on the Confucius Institute, my personal uh, view is it is just like United States Information Agency, which was in operation from 1953 to 1999. It's a tool of public diplomacy. Secondly, uh, any agency run by the government will have problems and Confucius Institute has own, its own problems. You know, I personally have observed its troubling behavior in operation here in the States and one time uh, in Europe. But overall, I think Confucius Institute are doing a very good job in terms of language teaching, in terms of culture teaching, 
in terms of reaching out to the greater American community, as a lot of the Confucius Institutes are working with the university, like Michigan State University, but they are really working with the local high schools. I think uh, Atlanta has three uh, Confucius Institute. The Emory one starts with working with Atlanta uh, High School. And uh, even uh, Confucius Institute mother agency, the Hanban, is doing a good job in filling academic uh, positions in the US with no or little string attached. For example, one of the universities over here accept uh, money donation from Hanban to create a position on sociology related to China with only one string. That string is you have to keep this position open while our money runs out. I think that's a very nice string uh, to, to have. So uh, to conclude, uh, I would say, I hope the US government is not going to politicize academic decisions, but more importantly, I hope all the administrators like Chancellor Martin, uh, Mike and uh, Phil, uh, when you make decisions or when you advise decision makers uh, to have an honest and objective academic need before you make the decision to get rid of Confucius Institute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yahweh. Uh, for another perspective of someone who has served as a professor and administrator at several universities uh, and is also a uh, member of the committee on uh, 100 and a, a leader in the Chinese American community, um, David Chang. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I heard a few times the headwinds type of words. So I guess in so far as the current challenges to U.S.-China uh, education uh, should be obvious to many of us. Uh, but the theme, if I understand it, uh, is the way forward. So I must con sort of congratulate the the Association U.S. Harvard China uh, in sponsoring this uh, webinar, uh, the timing could not have been better in terms of thinking uh, what is the way forward. Now, I do have a few, few graphs. So if you could switch to the second one, yes. Let me start my comments uh, by contrasting the inbound uh, students from China and outbound uh, U.S. students to, uh, to China. And as previous uh, speakers alerted to already, over the last 10, almost 15 years, there was a phenomenal growth in terms of the number of students coming uh, to U.S. And the numbers like back uh, was like 10 years ago was more like, like 50,000, and now it's all 400,000 even though the, the, the growth rate has slowed down even before the virus. And on the other side, you see the outbound students from the U.S. Uh, it, in all honesty, it's kind of pathetically small. Now, Dean uh, Brzezinski mentioned about soft power. There's uh, certainly people-to-people -people diplomacy through U.S. students' eyes uh, and by way of study abroad is an important concept. Um, but you can see that uh, as of uh, two years ago, the number was uh, 30 times less uh, than the inbound students from China. So the soft power issue become pretty problematic even before this, uh, this virus issue. So what I hope is to use this chart, keep in mind of this dynamics to make some observations. Next slide. So let me talk about, talk about the impact of this decline of uh, STEM students from China. Uh, what kind of perspective should we have? Uh, as a Dean of Engineering and then uh, President of Polytechnic University, I, I can say without any hesitation that the vitality of US graduation, uh, graduate education, particularly in engineering, really has been heavily depend on the infusion of international students, particularly from China and India in the last 30 years. And you will say, why is that so? 
in many ways, it because the job market is too good. Uh, U.S. students graduate with bachelor degree just dump right into uh, to the industry world and uh, with very very low motivation to continue the kind the graduate education. And then uh, 20 years ago or so, when companies are going through the restructuring, the support of their employees to uh, uh, to continue the education that has been diminishing. So for universities, particularly in engineering, looking to uh, the international students to fill the gap uh, is a, a very natural thing. Uh, I think I could say until recently, uh, I would say maybe two thirds of graduate programs, uh, graduate populations in engineering schools, uh, mainly from uh, international students. On the other side, uh, we have been having a pretty liberal immigration policy for highly skilled workers. Uh, the industry needs it, and it's relatively easy uh, to actually not just seek H-1B, but uh, at the, uh, after H-1B become permanent residents. So this kind of uh, in, uh, more liberal in immigration policy coupled with the, what we call the nano info bio revolution, nanotechnology, information technology, and biotech. Uh, this revolution is real and it's exposing, sort of uh, ex exploding, and that makes it possible for international students to decide to stay in the US after graduation to uh, pursue, in all honesty, their own American dream. I think the job market is right, is the impetus for many of the international students to not only come for US, but also stay here. But now as the tension be become, as, uh, between the two countries escal escalated, uh, you are seeing uh, closed door policy is shaping up in the name of different reasons obviously intellectual right protection, national security, and just this morning, uh, the, the new phrase is, uh, that I read from New York Times is uh, American for first recovery from the vi uh, virus uh, pandemic. So what, we, what, what clearly, in the short term, if you look at the closed door policy, uh, for various reasons, uh, it, it's going to be here. It is here. And what, but I think it, one must wonder, uh, we'll have to ask uh, someone of us uh, from higher education whether in the long haul uh, this uh, will kill, uh, impact uh, the competitiveness of our universities and our high tech industries. And as we speak, let me remind you. We're using Zoom, right? And the founder and CEO of Zoom is a Chinese American, uh, graduate with MBA from Stanford. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, this closed door policy uh, really is something that we need to address. But the shorter term challenge, of course, is, is what happened to next semester? What happened to all these Chinese students that cannot come uh, to U.S. campus in time for the fall semester. Now, various universities have their, uh, obviously have their, uh, next to the best solution, less than optimal solution. And I hope I can address that a little bit later. Uh, let me now turn to the other side of the ledger in terms of outbound uh, uh, students uh, to China. And we, mentioned it, that the, the number is really quite small. If you, if you talk about uh, soft power, uh, we're nowhere near there. The Chinese people know a lot more, a lot better uh, about US than we know about them. So with that as a background, uh, the moderator suggested earlier that I should say a few words about what I have been doing in, uh, in the city of Chengdu. So next slide. And basically, I established after I uh, stepped down as chancellor 
and uh, I was looking for some fun thing to do. So uh, I came up across this, uh, by then, uh, this 100,000 strong initiative between President Obama and President Hu Jintao. So we decided to establish a, a platform for the schools and the students who, uh, for the students who are from the schools that do not have the either financial means or knowledge of how to uh, establish their, uh, their program in China. So it's uh, basically the Sindhu American Center is a consortium. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, I will just uh, show you some of the uh, photographs. Uh, basically, it's a consortium with five American universities serves as principal partners and they provide the curriculum, provide the courses. Uh, Sichuan University, very uh, uh, highly ranked uh, university in China, uh, is our host institution. Uh, the students, uh, we, we actually recruit over beyond the five principal partners. We recruit over 20 plus campuses uh, in US for students uh, to go study for a semester or summer. Uh, over there. The picture on the right is actually our building. It's a standalone building. It uh, looks uh, both uh, uh, classical Chinese, but at the same time, a little bit of modern uh, aspect of it. It was actually designed by American and Canadian uh, commissioner, uh, missionaries uh, back oh, more than 100 years ago. It's now a historical landmark. Uh, the city was not, uh, generous enough to get it out inside and let us use it and rebuild it to our, our spec. Next. So, uh, so by now, uh, since the operation, we have graduated about 600 uh, students from various universities. Uh, we know that the purpose for them to go in there is not more, it's certainly more than rigorous academic program, but student life, extracurriculum, uh, and effort to reach out to meet the local people. So uh, I have these uh, links that you can see, but I will just skip that, go to the next. Uh, other than study abroad, we actually also offering internship and, and volunteers work. And in fact, before the virus, uh, the internship is uh, trending more in that direction. We actually have more than 50 companies in Chengdu, in the city of Chengdu, offering internships to our students. And uh, before the virus, uh, the uh, a school like uh, Stephen Institute of Technology had all, more than a dozen students sign up for the internship there. So, uh, uh, so that has been growing, except that now, uh, obviously, it's suspended. Uh, then, next. Uh, then a few years ago, we started a summer program. And what's interesting is uh, the summer program turns out that last year, for instance, our graduation, the picture in the bottom left, we had over 100 students graduated uh, last, uh, took, took courses in the summer. And they're not just from American kids, they're pretty much 50 50. And the other 50 are Chinese international students returning home for the summer vacation. And you're using that period of time to take courses and transfer back. Since we are offering American uh, courses, American curriculum and taught by in English and so on, so our courses uh, readily can transfer back. So uh, what is uh, my last uh, uh, observation about this is now, we talked about the uh, uh, crisis, that, uh, what happens to these quote unquote uh, strange uh, Chinese international set, uh, students currently residing in China. Turns out that uh, our principal partners, uh, specifically American University in Washington, D.C., and uh, also Valley Dickinson University, we put together what we have something called alternative uh, semester, four semester program in Chengdu for hopefully for those students, Chinese international students, other than take courses online as this alternative uh, way of uh, continue their, uh, their study without uh, uh, falling off track. So with that, uh, I, I, I like to stop here and I'm sure 
uh, we may uh, address some of this issue more uh, in more depth. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, David. Um, I especially appreciated the information about uh, Chengdu because as I was a visiting professor in 1987 at Sichuan University, and of course then there were there were no American students at all, so that's been a big uh, change. Um, I didn't realize I was part of soft power, but that was probably the uh, uh, the case. Um, and Sichuan University has also survived. Um, and now for a very, very important uh, perspective. Um, Professor Zhou has been listening to all of this exchange with all of this information, and um, uh, I would invite him to comment on any and all of it, uh, but especially from obviously the, the perspective of, uh, of China. Professor Zhou. Are you there? Well, we want to, or he's coming in, I think. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, can't, good, good. can see you. Okay. It's, uh, it's uh, a great honor to serve on this. Uh, uh, one thing after uh, hopefully we can get him back on but then we're going to go to uh, questions that any of the panelists have of each other or additional comments based on the conversation thus far and then, can you uh, hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good, good. Uh, yes. I agree with uh, uh, a lot of uh, things that have been said. Uh, I think we, we are facing a lot of challenges uh, in our uh, educational relationship. Um, uh, this is a part, uh, part of the broader uh, relationship. Uh, uh, that is uh, the China-US relationship. Uh, which are under tremendous strains, uh, uh, largely because of the current administration uh, in the U.S. Uh, the every almost every aspect of the relationship is being securitized. Uh, in other words, they look at it from a security perspective, uh, with a lot of suspicion and uh, 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 speculation. Um, so uh, educational exchange uh, is also uh, viewed through this lens. You know, Chinese scholars and students are viewed as potential spies and, and uh, exchange of information is a way of Chinese stealing information, uh, stealing technology from the US. And uh, also, the Confucius Institute uh, is an instrument of the Chinese Communist Party to infiltrate uh, in the U.S. and also to undermine U.S. academic uh, freedom. Uh, so all these uh, things are viewed from a security and ideological perspective, uh, which is very damaging. And also, they exaggerate everything. Uh, uh, every problem uh, that we encounter. For example, if uh, somebody is uh, stealing something, then it's uh, about every, uh, it's about every uh, aspect of the exchange. Uh, but it's like, you know, Chi Chinese government used to be very nervous about the US, uh, you know, professors and students coming to China. Uh, and there are people who, who look at the U.S. Uh, vis uh, you know visitors uh, from the same uh, perspective? Now the, uh, the, the 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 Trump administration is adopting this perspective to look at uh, you know, and a lot of people in the Congress too uh, look at uh, uh, China-U.S. relationship uh, in general, and also China-U.S. Uh, educational exchange in particular. Uh, so. Uh, Minor issues uh, are being exaggerated. 
uh, as if this is the whole picture. Uh, and also, uh, you know, China now is portrayed uh, as a demon, uh, 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 as a as a fierce, uh, you know, alien competitor uh, of, of the U.S. So this is uh, the general the, the general atmosphere. Uh, uh, it makes me uh, pretty sad. I think uh, the, the the you know what used to be a robust. Uh, exchange uh, of people-to-people uh, -people exchange and also educational exchange are now viewed as something, you know, uh, endangering <laughs> the U.S. <laughs> uh, uh, in China, we have some people like this too who view the uh, exchange as a sort of a threat, as a sort of risk to China. Um, the only difference is uh, in the U.S., these people are in power <laughs> in China. <laughs> Most of the extreme people are still outside the government. So we are facing a, a big challenge. Uh, I think educational exchange uh, is a tremendous asset uh, for both countries. Uh, for the U.S., I mean, it's a, no, the U.S. has benefited tremendously from, you know, getting talents to the U.S. Uh, and this 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 pool, uh, you know, magnetic effect of attracting talent uh, has made the U.S. very uh, a great country uh, in a way, uh, and has kept the U.S. Uh, advanced in uh, in many aspects, and uh, also uh, the you know, more specifically, the U.S. has uh, has gained financially. Uh, to support a lot of financial uh, educational institutions by this educational exchange, uh, and more importantly, I think uh, the U.S. has uh, uh, through the educational exchange demonstrated uh, how a system runs and how the world, you know, what uh, the U.S. Uh, values are, and 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 also, uh, you know, in a way to to keep pe people. Uh, to at least to make people understand the U.S., appreciate the U.S. This is part of uh, what, uh, you know, um, Professor John said, uh, soft, soft power <laughs> of, of the U.S., okay. Uh, and and as, as far as China is concerned, I think uh, China has a lot to learn. Uh, I mean, Chinese students want, U.S. is the favorite destination of China, uh, Chinese students. Uh, and also, uh, U.S. Uh, has the best schools uh, uh, for for Chinese students and parents. And and also, uh, you know, this helps Chinese to understand the U.S. Uh, and also uh, help uh, the U.S. to understand China to some extent. Uh, so it's a, it's it's a, this through this kind of exchange, both countries have benefited tremendously. Uh, it's a great pity that within just few years, uh, such a positive thing has been turned into such a negative, uh, it has been put into such a uh, negative light. Uh, uh, only this administration can do this. Uh, I, I feel very sorry about it. When I was in the U.S. many, many years ago to study, I, you know, the U.S. to me uh, was a country of great confidence, a lot of tolerance, and also, uh, 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 you know, very uh, um, generous. Yeah. But within a few years, you know, the U.S. has become very different country. Uh, uh, very disappointing. Uh, I just hope that this is going to change. Uh, I don't. I don't know what uh, what's going to happen in the next few years. Uh, uh, I think maybe the, the atmosphere uh, has been poisoned uh, to the extent that uh, it requires great effort to restore the previous level of uh, comfort uh, in exchange, uh, uh, previous level of exchange. Uh, but I do believe that through the uh, joint efforts on the part of the good-hearted people in both countries, uh, we can arrest the trend of deterioration 
and 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 then restore uh, uh, and, and then uh, improve uh, uh, our educational exchanges as well as uh, people to people exchange between the two countries at large. Okay. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any additional comments or questions uh, from the panel before we go to the uh, audience questions? Um, Min Fan, do you, have you been collecting these things? Yes, we have quite a bit of questions piled up. Right, you, you get the choice to uh, choose some and, and throw it in the pot here. Sounds good. So there seemed to be a theme around um, the students um, currently in the US. Uh, there's a question from Frank Doche, uh, Director of Networks and Engagement Asia Society. His question is, there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese students studying at US today and tens of thousands of domestic US students studying Chinese. Given this reality, how should US universities work to integrate the educational intercultural development of Chinese and domestic U.S. students. And related to that, another question is, did the U.S. institutions miss opportunities to better welcome and acculturate PRC students over the past few decades? Uh, may, <clears throat> may I make a brief uh, comment on this? Sure. Um, uh, there is in the literature and thinking about internationalization a new relatively new idea which we call internationalization at home which means that um, American universities and I think this is relevant for China also to think about this American universities should do a better job uh, of providing international experiences to the students that the domestic students and the international students who are studying on their campuses and I think we have not done a good enough job. We do a lot, but not enough uh, to um, in, uh, in, incorporate students from China and other countries who are studying in the US uh, in the uh, extracurricular and other programs on our own campuses. So I think this is a very important question that doesn't depend on good or bad relations between the two countries, but something which our academic institutions can do a little bit more about. Any other um, comments? I, I might have a shout out to this Asia Society program, which is uh, dedicated to bringing US students and Chinese students together to interact on American campuses. Uh, and it's um, a way of internationalizing without leaving home, so to speak, for the U.S. institutions anyway. Um, I'll take a go at that as well. Um, this is an age-old question and difficulty, a real challenge is how do you connect international students from around the world with American students that they can learn from and with one another in co-curricular ways? And there are many outstanding examples of what I'll call boutique programs that are very small scale, touch maybe even a few hundred students a year. Um, but large scale efforts that really try to touch the far majority of students are very, very hard to find, extremely challenging and difficult to bring about. And this is something that I've noodled on for many years and still haven't found what I consider to be a good formula to to do something. The one program I will say that I've seen touch a lot of lives is something like an international friendship program where you match students from abroad and friendship relationships with community residents. And that seems to be one that promotes significant learning at a at a at a people to people level, um, but it, but it's not campus based. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Hill. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that uh, uh, my school uh, has a, a sort of a joint uh, lecture program with Stanford. Uh, so every year, uh, Stanford would have uh, 20 students, uh, uh, Peking University will have 20, 20 students, and uh, we'll have a standard for professor to teach for uh, to to lecture thirty minutes and Chinese Beida professor to lecture thirty minutes and then we have thirty minutes for discussion. We use this uh, virtual uh, 
uh, kind of uh, uh, internet uh, uh, system. Uh, it works really well. It's like we are in the same classroom, and but without having uh, to go through the trouble of travel <laughs> and a lot of organizational work uh, uh, like that. I, I think it, it, maybe this is a uh, going to be. Uh, uh, I mean, it used to be very expensive, but now uh, I think with the uh, the Zoom, with other you know <laughs> you know internet tools, we can do that more easily in the in the future. Right. I would agree with you, Professor Zhao. We're going to see a proliferation of that kind of activity in the future, um, probably more so because of COVID-19 than anything. Well, let me add, uh, chime in. I, I think part of this problem is also cultural on the part of Chinese students themselves. They tend to cusser around by themselves and mainly looking to each other as support structure but uh, not necessarily have that uh, our looking sort of somehow uh, getting into the mainstream American culture. So in a way, it uh, unfortunately, uh, it may require the administration at each university to sort of uh, uh, develop programs that were kind of Chinese students are expected uh, to participate at least initially when they first show up on campus. And I, I, I think we face the same problem uh, in the summer programs uh, in Chengdu that where we have uh, uh, Chinese international students study with uh, American kids together, uh, finding activities for them to actually mingle together has been a challenge. By the same token, we had no problem getting buddy system set up with the local college students and get uh, the American kids to mingle with them. So, so this is something that uh, you may find good program here and there, but in terms of institutionally, I think the culture has to be uh, more, has to be substantial in uh, changing, making uh, not only school development program, but also changing the attitude of Chinese international students, that they are here in the U.S. more than just get a degree. And uh, that's sort of my own experience about this. And I think you're right, David. It's very hard to do. Um, the, the one way to really bring it about is make it a curricular requirement somehow, some way. Right, 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 right. That, that's very true. I think you, you, you somehow make it as a a required seminar course, uh, non-credit or whatever. Or some, some, yeah. some co-curricular requirement attached to a course. Yeah. Right, right, I, exactly. So, so Blaine, I, would you like another more. question from the audience? Please. Um, this question is really about, um, you all have given strong counter arguments to the, um, the, uh, the restricting type of policy. And how would you respond to those who are more concerned that the policy of engagement with China can tend to ignore China's very real human rights abuses? And so how do you navigate uh, around censorship and monitoring of classes? Oh, this is harder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mind taking it on uh, from the viewpoint that uh, as the uh, moderator introduced to me earlier, I have been a longtime member of the so-called Committee of 100, uh, consists of American, uh, Chinese Americans of, across the, uh, the board from different uh, industries. And we have this uh, basic uh, model, so to speak, sort of we kind of accept the difference but seek common, ground, common grounds. Kind of in a way, you, you have to accept the, the differences before you can look for seeking common ground. So, so that's my reaction to that question. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Professor Joe. Yeah, well, uh, I think the two countries have differences uh, with regard to how to uh, protect human rights. Uh, China uh, insists on, uh, uh, pr you know, uh, prioritize economic and uh, uh, collective rights 
uh, community rights, uh, whereas uh, the U.S. and also Western countries in general uh, focus on individual rights, uh, especially political rights. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, when, when, whenever a human rights issue is raised on the part of uh, Americans, uh, the Chinese government is nervous because it, 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 it thought it thinks that uh, it's a, a conspiracy <laughs> to undermine the Chinese government's legitimacy. Uh, so uh, this is a sensitive topic. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, the educational exchanges, uh, including joint lecture uh, practices, help to uh, such kind of understanding, uh, raise the awareness of uh, the issues that uh, uh, people on both sides uh, attach a lot of importance to. Uh, uh, if the Americans want to persuade the Chinese uh, that uh, you know individual political rights are more important than uh, economic and and uh, collect the so-called collective rights then uh, or development rights then uh, you know uh, this is a way to communicate. Uh, I think uh, Chinese government uh, uh, does not resist to dialogue uh, uh, and 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 exchange, but. Uh, uh, it's very nervous uh, when it comes to uh, accusation, condemnation, and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, so uh, in that regard, I think education, uh, 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 promoting mutual understanding is helpful, uh, even if you want to advance uh, uh, your views uh, on the question of human rights. Uh, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Human rights. Chinese often focus. The Chinese government often focus on, on you know, how to to eliminate uh, poverty uh, and 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 also um, uh, reduce the gap between the rich and poor and that sort of thing, which is a very important issue in the U.S. too. Okay, so uh, how how we can overcome this kind of uh, how we can deal with this kind of issue? Uh, this. Uh, uh, these two days, I, I'm attending the standing committee of the uh, uh, session of the, on, on, on anti-poverty campaign. Uh, so people raise a lot of uh, ideas about how to combat uh, the absolute poverty, how to eliminate absolute poverty in China. Uh, the Chinese government has set a goal of eliminating absolute poverty in three years. <laughs> we are in the third year. Okay. So this is something that maybe the Amer Americans find it very interesting uh, because the U.S. is facing a, a similar problem, uh, uh, posing a big challenge uh, as well. Uh, so I don't think uh, we can, uh, we both can benefit from such kind of exchanges, even on the human rights issue. Um. I'm going to make an incredibly pompous comment that these two great countries are in many respects at the present moment not serving as very good role models in a number of areas. Uh, but, um, and that will probably be true for, for the, certainly the foreseeable future. But the question of withdrawing engagement uh, seems only to exacerbate this problem rather than rather than further it. Um, but it's obviously a issue that is, uh, um, overlays a lot of the other concerns that we've had. Any other, um, uh, one thing, um, so we only have about a little less than 15 minutes uh, to go. And I was thinking that, that to give uh, the panelists an opportunity to um, talk a little bit about the way forward and, um, I'd suggested maybe talking about those specific elements in our current engagement or possible future engagement that might stand the best chance of, of being uh, developed and enhanced over the next uh, few years when the headwinds are obviously going to be very strong. Um, and uh, so who wants to go, wants to go first? Well, I can make a couple of very brief, com very brief comments. Um, one, one is uh, in response to the, your point and also the, uh, the question that was raised before, um, and we uh, 
we've all, we've all said this, and that is engagement is what is important. And we can't let that, uh, for, uh, for us in the academic community, we have to keep that uh, front and center. Uh, second point uh, is, um, uh, it's been mentioned a little bit, but I think it's uh, important in the, in the coming period where we will be relying more and more on, uh, on the internet uh, for com communication, for data, for knowledge, and so on. Uh, we do face in China the Great Firewall, uh, which affects communications in, to some extent, and we shouldn't leave that out of the discussion. And my final point is one that I made before, which is, I think, internationalization at home. And part of this is using, as several of us have mentioned, uh, ways of communicating directly uh, with, with uh, uh, classes, with individuals, and so on, using the internet for, uh, for uh, communication between uh, students uh, and faculty, for that matter, and researchers in China and America. I think we face a challenge um, uh, of uh, academic collaboration in research. For example, it's impressive the number of jointly authored articles by American and Chinese scholars uh, over the many years. The numbers have gone up uh, dramatically and we need to protect that because that's a key part of how, acad how academe works and how the collaboration between uh, individual scholars and researchers uh, functions. And um, we can do that in most fields, not in all, um, without too much concern about the politicization of these things. Thanks. Right. Um, David, you want to weigh in? OK. On? All right. I can't help thinking that uh, I think early on, uh, one of the speakers mentioned about this uh, intellectual part, property protections and uh, also even national security. Uh, why those are the sort of reasons uh, why we see a closer, uh, more and more close law policy on uh, immigrations. For those of us who actually are very attuned to some of the cases uh, that recently uh, happened in, uh, for researchers uh, across uh, the country, and particularly in bio, biotech fields, bioscience fields, uh, we find that while the uh, industrial uh, uh, intellectual property issues are real, uh, some students uh, or workers, uh, scholars come to the U.S. with certain purpose. But by and large, I think it's, uh, it's an issue of disclosure. Because by and large, I think schools and collaborating with each other, there are joint research projects uh, between, I mean, uh, between the two countries. In fact, uh, NSF has even bilateral research grants and things like that. And uh, so it's not so much it, uh, that's not the right direction, but it's more of uh, the Chinese scientists, Chinese uh, faculty, often or sometimes non-Chinese faculty, like the famous case at Harvard, that disclosure became, uh, became the issue that is not transparent enough to, to, for people to understand the nature of these collaborations. So in many ways, to address this issue, we also need to educate uh, as one of my C100 members said, often said, don't do dumb things. So, so <laughs> sometimes we do dumb things uh, and created confusions. So I think that uh, one possible way looking forward, uh, not to necessarily discourage collaboration, but more making sure it's transparent. Right, Mike Brzezinski, uh, your thoughts on the question? They're very challenging, uncertain times. I think we're going to see more, um, unfortunately, I think we're going to see legislative action in the near future, restricting even more um, employment opportunities. There's been talk about that already, about F1OPT. Um, 
unfortunately, I think near term, it, it, we're going to see more challenging times than 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 the, than the turning about or fa about face, um, at least for for international international students here. Uh, any particular programs that you think would would stand a better chance of being, um, um, you know, able to fly under the radar, if you will, in the midst of all these uh, challenges? Well, there are, I mean, with the restrictions that currently exist for hiring um, international researchers and faculty uh, because of the, the executive order yesterday the, with, the, with the inability for visas to be issued. I mean, there are, there are certain visa types that are still available, but the bar is much higher, such as O1, um, but they are much more labor intensive and probably don't really work well for freshly minted PhD graduates. Um, so it's, it's going to be a, a tough road ahead, at least in the near, near term. Right. Yahweh? Yeah, uh, I, I think there are multiple issues uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, number one is, uh, I think as Mike uh, referred to, is what will be the decisions, you know, either executive order like uh, what happened yesterday or new laws uh, stipulated uh, by, by Congress. So for Chinese students and researchers, you know, they have to be very much aware. You know, I think one of the questions from the audience is, uh, what's the vetting process? You know, will all STEM students, applicants be denied? You know, MIT has not uh, admitted any Chinese students in the past two years, uh, if I remember uh, correctly. So that, uh, I think, maybe after the election, you know, we don't know what is going to happen. That will have a huge impact in terms of what kind of restrictions the U.S. government is going to impose on students and researchers coming from China. Now, if this is going to be a huge barrier, then what's next is uh, what American universities and colleges will do in terms of reaching out to those who cannot come over here. Now, NYU uh, in Shanghai, Duke in Kunshan, uh, you know, the Schwarzman scholars and Yanjing Academy. Uh, I hope they're all going to continue and, and Chinese government have extended uh, privileges in terms of, you know, no uh, great firewall and all that. Uh, will other American universities uh, continue to engage China that way? Uh, in this aspect, I think the Chinese government will have to be clear whether they're going to welcome more American universities to set up campuses in China. Right now, I think the restrictions, the barriers, the threshold is very high. Uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, for them to, to operate. You know, you have to have a partner, then you have to have the party operating on campus and all those issues. Uh, number three is the joint degree program uh, that some of the speakers have mentioned. Uh, it looks to me uh, many universities, I think Chancellor Martin talked about the joint uh, MBA. Uh, Fordham University has just uh, canceled uh, its own joint MBA with Peking University. Uh, they're only going to take care of those that are in the pipeline and no more enrollment. So that's another way of American universities and colleges engaging China. So I hope the universities and colleges over here, maybe uh, public universities under uh, political pressure, but private institutions uh, should be more proactive in setting up these joint uh, degrees. So there are multiple, and virtual uh, teaching, I, I think uh, Zoom, uh, I, I think has a very uncertain uh, future in China. The, the government seemed to have imposed uh, some restrictions on how Zoom meetings are going to be held, particularly if it's initiated uh, in, in China. And we read about uh, how Zoom actually canceled uh, accounts uh, of those who try to have meetings. So that, that's an issue that China also have to face. So this is a very much interactive process. It takes leadership, uh, courage, vision of leaders on both sides uh, to, to make it work. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think US and China will all go down. Thanks. Uh, very well. Uh, I think we're just about running out of uh, time uh, to give uh, Min Fan uh, a chance to close this uh, session. I want to thank all of the panelists. I have to note that uh, uh, Chancellor Martin um, had to leave before the end of our 
to, before he got to this point. Otherwise, we would ask him to weigh in on it. We appreciate uh, all of you, and especially uh, Professor Zhao for joining us from uh, uh, Beijing. I think we can all safely say that a lot of the future will be clarified um, by the vac a vaccine and November. And then maybe we can con continue the conversation. Uh, so thanks very much for everybody. And maybe we ought to make this a kind of running conversation. I've enjoyed it very much. And uh, thank you all. Ben Fan, it's yours. Okay, thank you, Blaine. But before we actually part here, um, we have a lot of parents on the call, Chinese parents, and they were asking, do you think I should send my kids to America this fall? Can everyone <laughs> give a quick answer? Any? I think Mike is in the best position to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, it really boils down to your risk aversion level. I mean, there are so many uncertainties. There are many universities like Purdue who are going to do their very best to open. They'll have face-to-face -face courses. They'll have hybrid courses that will have both face-to-face -face time as well as remote. There'll be online options. And many universities are saying, well, if you don't like those options on campus, then try for a completely online camp, uh, option anywhere in the world, which could be back home. So it really, I think, depends on one's risk aversion level, and you have to make each individual decision based on that. Great. Any other comments? I'd have to observe this. I would, I would encourage the, uh, the parents uh, to look at the website that I have in the, the Gmail China website to see what the alternative for semester in China maybe look like. Okay, great, thank you. Some of these same uncertainties are, of course, present among U.S. students and families as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Of course, the, it's much more complicated for international students. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, at this time, we will conclude this event. I do want to mention that coming up, uh, there are a lot of questions about younger uh, demographic students, their experiences. We have an event about the importance of developing future leaders in collaboration with international student conferences on July 14th and also on July 28th, we're working with U University of Southern California, U.S. China Institute uh, to bring about how can even U.S. China collaborate for public health. So stay tuned. Thank you again for joining us and thank you all the panelists for taking the time and have a great rest of your day or evening. Mm -hmm.